I'm Joshua James with Defer Science. We have Andrew Lister with Detigo Global, and um, I'm really excited to talk to him today specifically about his career path and how he actually got into forensics and what he's working on now. So Yeah, no, great. Thanks, Joshua. And as I mentioned, my name's Andy. I have a background in the military here in the UK and joined the Royal Marine Commandos at 18 and graduated through to our reconnaissance, junior commanders, senior commanders, and then uh, graduated up from that to our special forces selection for SAS, SBS. I guess, how long, uh, you talked about your military experience, how long were you in the military and what kinds of work did you do specifically in the military? What kinds of work did you do related to forensics, let's say? Um, yeah, through the military. Well, but I think now it's the modern world, you know, gone are the days of the um, regular soldiers and even the, the special operations teams, uh, like the teams I was running with, uh, not having some kind of digital capability, the ability to push forward and extract data and intelligence, and indeed in a lot of cases, evidence uh, from the devices you find. You know, um, it used to be we'd go into... Uh, new sort of special operations units that maybe aren't as, as, as far forward as um, luckily some of the, the key Western groups that we'd work with. And instantly, you know, they've got a million skill sets already and they're asking questions, well, why do I need to do the, you know, this digital side? And you're going, well, you consider yourself a professional operator in this damn world. Is there any way you've deployed in the world where you do not come across computers, phones, thumbsticks, MacBooks, hard drives? And what do you do? Do you ignore them? Do you gather that really important quick J2 intelligence that is uh, on target, on scene? Do you wait for it to go back to a lab to get lost in the melee or does that come forward? So all these things um, kind of evolved through the military. And I was lucky enough to hit the ground running coming from a reconnaissance troop in the Royal Marines and then into our special operations. And then four years in a cell that did the, uh, the covert and over exploitation. So that's everything from the ability to be able to um, work with uh, people that are giving us information, potentially force protection. So looking after our own staff, you maybe operate in a location where you're you're working away from everybody else and you have local nationals that are to some degree trusted, but there's always an element of distrust there. Potentially, can you quickly look across their digital devices just to see potentially is there, you know, do they, do they, are, are they searching for a lot of the uh, local terrorist organizations? Are they looking at information around your camp in more detail than they should be? So it's not always just what you think in regards to going out, facing down the enemy, quickly pulling data, getting the results back. It can quite often be just protecting yourselves as a small group. It can be on the covert side. So um, using tradecraft to enter hotels, houses, whatever it is, uh, in these permissive and non-permissive environments, really. Uh, to gain that intelligence or evidence. So again, there is a big crossover now between what the military do uh, in these certain circles and what the police do. So for that that four-year period, I ran a cell called the uh, Joint Effects Cell, the, the JET or the exploitation side of it. That's MPE, Material, People and Equipment Exploitation. Uh, and that that is that encompasses everything. So wet forensics, uh, digital forensics, cyber, all these kind of, Pieces. The problem being, of course, military already have a million skill sets. It's not, in most cases, your day job. Mm -hmm. So you're then getting pushed in to go, okay, we need to give these guys, and in some cases, girls that go to some of these locations, the ability to do something that, that very quickly, very easily, without that training burden. How do we do that? And the answer was, go and get all the experts. So we went to GCHQ, we went to Cheltenham. We went to all the main agencies that do these kind of things, Scotland Yard, GCHQ, um, uh, SO15, which is the counter-terror police, all these different pieces. And we said, look, we know you've spent decades honing your skills, getting all this experience, and I know it's going to be painful, but we need you just to give us the golden nuggets right now. Give us all the best pieces that you've learned to give us best effect forward. And that's where it started. So this all kind of started at that initial forward phase. Originally, it was bag and tag. And so maybe some of your viewers are familiar with that old school going in, you may be on a location, there's a lot of digital evidence there and it's getting swept in a bag. You know, those those days in many ways have gone because the information you can gain rapidly in a lot of cases now is it, just so effective for us. Okay. Um, again, just 
because I think the military aspect is so different than maybe criminal or civil investigation. You you mentioned a lot of different skills. You mentioned on scene or applying it to um, intelligence, counterintelligence, local protection, all of these different things. Can you just break it down kind of as easy as possible? What would a, a relatively standard digital investigation for the military look like? It's a bag of dolly mixtures. And that's that's part of the magic, really, of the way that um, the military has grabbed the best of both. So it's it's gone to all these agencies and groups. It's gone to companies like ourselves and said, look, we can't individually learn these 10 tools mm-hmm. to give us 100% of what we want. We don't have the time, the cognitive ability. We don't have the resources. Can you condense that and give us at least 80% of everything we require? But the training burden and skill fade is is massively reduced. And, and you know, clearly I now work for a commercial company. I use this technology downrange, not just at the, the front line, but at a kind of fusion cell kind of piece, sort of that lab kind of effect. So a massive vested interest in uh, in making sure the technology does what it needs to do. Too many devices, too much data, mm-hmm. not enough experts out there. Um, so we're trying to bring something to the table that, that can assist that. In regards to a standard military, it depends on the group. Yeah. So you might have more elite troops who are going in and maybe let's let's theoretically use Ukraine at the moment. You know, um, some of the, the fighters there might have downed an individual, come across them. That individual has a mobile on them, has a thumbstick on them, has a camera from doing surveillance and has an SD card in that or a drone. You know, at that point, at that instant, that intelligence is just mind-blowingly critical. How it would have been done 10 years ago is all that would get bagged up. It might even be left in some cases, and then it would eventually get sent back. Somebody would go, what do we do with this? It goes off to one agency and passes it to another. They find some key critical data. Oh, awesome. Well done, guys. But that gets lost in the, you know, the Chinese whispers. The communication chain takes ages. So we're trying to work out organic ways that organizations could have the technology and skills up front but still feed all of the greater agencies that are SMEs, uh, subject matter experts, specifically in those fields. So you're you're managing to cover off both sides. So at that point, you might have someone going forward and and pulling that critical data off a phone or a device live time at the front end. You might be on another job. Um, We have for about four years held a contract with a discrete US agency. They have all their trade craft weighed off. Everything is legal, covert method of entry all these kind of pieces against um, bad uh, actors across the globe, really. Uh, And they add the technology to that. So that's being able to extract data and using the technology skills blended with their tradecraft in order to leave everything in situ how it was. So it doesn't ever look touched from a physical point of view or from a a data digital point of view, but still pulling back the, the critical information. So there is no, there is no, there is no standard. You can go down pretty much every kind of avenue. You want to, the, the critical thing is, and rest assured that the vast majority of organisations now are, are grabbing this. They're realising that um, when, when I first came into this in the military, we were blessed in the organisation ours with you sort of sat at the top of the tree, and if you requested something, you generally got it. Um, but even in that field now, you're finding. There's so much stress on anything related to cyber, digital. It's massive. So organizations, three-letter agencies, whatever it is that maybe supported you regularly can't because they're influx doing their primary task, even though yours is a high-value target. And then you find, well, hang on, what do we need to well, we need some answers ourselves. So again, going back to that, having an organic capability in a bag that can be usable for for the operators. Okay, so uh, if I can, if I can kind of summarize this, um, you know, com- coming from the criminal investigation perspective, it almost sounds like um, you had support labs. They were taking a long time to process the data, and this is you know critical intelligence that you're trying to process. So you might find something, let's say on scene or in the field, and then that would need to be sent back and processed by your lab. But then that can take too long because it's potentially actionable intelligence. What I would call first responders you know, 90, 80%, 90% of, of the way, and then given them tools, that way they can actually respond in the field and start to collect and analyze data immediately. Is that essentially yeah. what, what I'm hearing? Okay. Absolutely. But going a step further than that, we have it with what's called like, a let's call it a level one, two, and three. 
Level one would be that first responder, that incident responder that, that goes there, be it police or be it military, mm-hmm. in whatever fashion it is. And this is where the technology blends. We're currently working with likes of Op Atom in the home office here for police officers to do similar to what SF did in the, the SF Special Forces in the manner that I was just describing there, but into homes managing serious sexual offenders. So it might have been where an officer goes in to manage a previous serious sexual offender and and thinks, you know, that, that investigating for 20 years, the hair on the back of the neck goes up, something is not right here, but I'm not a digital expert and I'm not seeing anything else. So I'll report back to the lab and I'll ask for justification to seize the 24 devices in the home. The lab is already backlogged by six months, sadly, because it's just it's just overwhelmed, which is a common uh, piece across all the world. And the and the, the user, the frontline police officer, then you know can't really do anything at that point. So we've started now adding that triage, blending the best of both the quick intelligence investigation piece, but making it evidential and having clear, easy steps. In some case, patented technology from us for those officers to be able to do that, get quick identification. Yes, there is illicit material. Great. Well, not great clearly, but great in the sense of we can bring justice. They can then remove those devices to the lab for further exploitation. And again, we've had we've had so many, uh, we work with counter-terror borders, we work with a lot of the ICAT community, Internet Crimes Against Children, CSAM, and, and so on. And everybody's loved that frontline rapid response, adding common sense with great digital technology and, and, and the boffins that sit in the cave doing all the development, they are awesome. And, and But putting all, all that together, they loved on that front line. And then we started getting, maybe five years ago, a big ask to say, well, can't you do more on the lab side? Use the same ethos and mentality because the digital tide is against us. As we said, too many devices, too much data, not enough individuals being able to process this. Can you do these profiles? Can you do these? So we blended all that into the lab side. And now we've got some exciting lab technology um, that basically enables you to put job cues of 20, 30 different digital high-level forensic examination techniques in a row, press a button, and the technology does complex under the hood, but is relatively easy on the front side. Can't okay. experience, but yeah. it also frees up the examiner to do the, the, let's call it the more difficult stuff that you, you can't do. I assume that the tools that you're talking about, I mean, the, all this development is actually taking place in the Tigo. Is that correct? Yeah, de- oh, I mean, okay. course, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm here with Detigo, but as Detigo, we play really good. We like to think we're the good player in the market. You know, we play nice in the playpen with other technologies. We import many of our competitors into our technology so that, it, so that if a user already has multiple different tools, they can utilize some of our um, analytics that maybe other tools don't have. They can do link analysis, all this, mm-hmm. all this great stuff. But of course, yeah, I mean, Detigo is... It is pioneering the way forward. It's mainly because it's been lucky enough to have that blend, what I call the best of both. It's had the blue and it's had the black. It's had the police and it's had the special ops. And it's kind of mashed them all together and taken the best bits from each. And gone, what can we learn for the for the greater good of each of those groups? And as a fallout, that works for borders. It works for uh, corporate. Um, you know, it just depends how you want to utilize the, the technology. Of course, there's multiple other tools out there. Um, it's quite flattering, copying similar kind of methodologies and pieces uh, from that. And, uh, and in the real world, of course, not one tool is going to do everything for you, clearly. And those of you that are experienced out there know that. Those of you that aren't, there's no, there's no sort of golden fleece that's going to cure everything for you. But what it can do is a significant amount to get you a massive head start um, across that. I think the Americans actually taught, taught me that um, one is none and two is one. Uh-huh. Okay. You've got the unlimited choice. That's what I do. Um, can you can you expand? You've talked a little bit about you know the products now and and how they apply to industry. But can you talk about your role in uh, Detigo and specifically how your military experience transfers to a private company? You you touched on it a little bit, I think, but. Um, you know, as somebody in digital forensics, if they're starting from a military background, like where do they go? How do they actually transfer those skills to another part of digital forensics uh, sector or maybe even another industry altogether? Yeah, I, th- I think I was specifically lucky, really, because it's, you know, the government spends millions on the special operators globally in all the different units, you know, wherever they are. So you do kind of have a very different career path to 
other individuals when you come out. And again, it just, the stars aligned. So I've been using the technology. I'd actually been probably a great pain in the obvious for Vitigo, constantly hitting them up, asking for changes in technology, coming up with issues that we were finding forward. I, I keep my security clearances. So you're talking in semi-veiled speech to try and go, oh, if I had this kind of problem, could you solve it without giving the game away completely? And they were really good at it. So uh, when I came out, I got approached. Uh, there, there was an individual working for a discrete government aid or previous government agency and then working for the company approached me and said, would you like to join? And I came in under special projects and sales. And then over time, just built up the history in the company, helped with the development, helped intrinsically with the, the developers themselves, although I can't code, all the way through to the trainers and then the market inside. And it just it just exploded from there, really, and then became the um, director for sales. And uh, about five months ago, the, the managing director. Um, and obviously, we've just rebranded and stuff as we sort of push our team forward. So. And did you have to, I mean, did your military experience like let you, like, did you already have kind of uh, knowledge about how all those, all those aspects of the job worked through the military or is this like constant learning? Like, how did you, how did you get those skills to be able to do all of these different things? It's constant learning, but the, the key piece is, with, and this is a difficult one, there's a big veteran push out there in the UK and, and of course in the US and globally and pieces like this. And one of the biggest barriers to that for um, for some individuals is not understanding that correlation between what you do in the military versus how that comes across in the private sector. It is extremely similar, just change your words. Mm. So, you know, it's like changing your suit. You go from a green suit or a black suit, jumping through windows out of planes, whatever it is, to a shirt and tie or, you know, a polo top or whatever it happens to be. It's that same kind of piece. And the, the skills that are individuals have from the military because we're talking specifically about the military here it's the same with police and other agencies and industries that they can bring across with just their communication friendships being able to utilize i mean let's not forget it's people people are key you know if you have great developers great marketing great trainers great sales individuals all these different pieces they're going to fall down if they work in their own compartmented areas and don't gel well and there is this great bond and peace through the military that I, that I do think comes across uh, when we come into that private sector. And of course, you're very used to working with massive organizations with multiple sensitive kind of commercial and government uh, relationships built into that. So, um, yeah, I think it's I think it's the best of both, to be honest. Um, it would just be brilliant for any veterans out there. Just take a bit of time, find a mentor, sit with someone, regardless of whether it's digital forensics, cyber, whatever it is, find someone. Most people are willing to help a little bit and just get a bit of a, a, a teaching on how change your mind or not always change your mind, but pull across to how is everything that I did on that military side transferable and where are the areas where it's not. That is also um, important as well. Great. Yeah, but it's, it's been a great journey for me so far. So. Great. Yeah, I mean, I think not just military, anyone w looking to get into digital forensics or switch switch what they're doing um, should be looking to get a mentor anyway. So I think that's a really excellent point. Um, uh, you talked a little bit about um, uh, branding and advertising, and I noticed I just checked your website this morning and I saw the, the new Detigo Global um, logo. Like usually whenever there's a logo update or like the site looks different, there's some reason behind it. Is this just something you wanted to do is there a reason like what 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 is that about <laughs> can you tell us a little bit yeah, well, i think the, the tigo has been around for well over a decade and producing cutting edge technology and initially we were this boutique british company um that was working in the sensitive gray areas with special operations and others uh, and it that kind of worked for us as a group because back then this technology was much more kind of a hush hush but now everybody knows there's abilities to break encryption albeit hard in some cases there's abilities to scan devices you can pull back deleted data all these different things are known so that, that that's no longer regarded as sensitive it's when you blend that um blend that with other uh pieces so um that's kind of where we ended up with with the tigo coming across that so yeah mm. You've been talking about tools a little bit and and applications to different areas, especially military. But what um, I guess what is Tigo working on? What can we expect from you guys 
uh, this year or coming up in the future? hundred <laughs> percent. I mean, along with the, the rebranding that we've just gone through, I mean, clearly that, that was driven by Bud and the marketing team. So a big shout out to uh, the team that have done a fantastic job because we have now pushed from, like I say, that, that discreet little bubble uh, that we were into a global powerhouse, multi-million pound contracts with government agencies, but we're sticking with that ethos where if you are the single loan investigator in the small little force that is out wherever in whatever police department, we are answering the phone, we are taking in your concerns and, and we are working like that as well. So the company is staying flexible, agile, and really trying to do the right thing. If I'm honest, if you look across everything that Detigo does now, it's got things like offline translation, photo DNA, AI object detection for weapons, cars, nudity, indecent images, jihadist symbology, right-wing symbology, there's link analysis, super fast, rapid imaging. Nearly all of those things have come from client requests as opposed to just organically driven by us as a, as a company. So we are driving forward like that. What we have noticed is that there's a, <coughs> there's a large need within the uh, forensic commercial community for these kind of technologies that face the same problems the police uh, and the military have. So we've started pushing a lot of our technology across to the, the civil and corporate investigators. Of course, there's still some covert and sensitive sides that, that, that are not required. But on top of that, we've got a case management system. So that's quite new and that's still evolving. So that, again, across police forces, lining up the management of your forensic incidents, your workflows, having all your exhibits uh, tracked and other parts that come into your investigations, automatic alerts, and to really streamline that. And in fact, police forces have had that for a long time in different ways. What we're trying to do is make it easier, more flexible, and built into uh, the kind of the Tigo workflow, if you like. Whereas the military haven't done that quite so much. So we're actually bringing that part of the technology across to the military from, um, from the law enforcement side, which is great. On top of that, we've got endpoint monitoring. So that can be from, again, a commercial point of view, wanting to make sure that you're employing the right people, that there's um, uh, no commercial espionage going on, pieces like this, maybe someone's leaving. Uh, it's it's endpoint as as a person, not endpoint as in like a, a networked server somewhere, correct? Well, endpoint as in a, a digital device. Okay. Um, but that enables you, obviously, to monitor individuals and also uh, it, it overtly or covertly. So including we're trying to uh, help other countries that maybe are not as far forward in digital forensics and areas like that. And sadly, in a lot of these uh, countries and areas, there is a higher rate of corruption, et cetera, probably an argumentative fact there. But uh, And so also uh, some of the clients that we have in these regions want some kind of security round and being able to monitor to some degree what they do. Of course, it's a, it's a choice and sensitive uh, piece of technology just because of the way that it can obviously be utilized, even remote acquisition now. So uh, we did a great demo around Sweden with Magnus of uh, High 2 Consulting. Uh, we've been working over there for maybe eight years. We've never lost a client, never lost a client. We've always expanded over there or they've renewed our technology, which is great. But we were able to access a computer back in the UK, remotely acquire that and bring the evidence over a lifetime whilst in a in a short live in-person demonstration. Was that for internal investigations you're talking or? It's like a lot of these things. It depends how people want to use the technology. Okay. Um, this specific uh, piece was for internal investing. So okay. again, you're in a company, you put it out on your multiple um, machines that are spread across the globe. And rather than traveling to do all those pieces or having to have individually trained experts mm -hmm. in the regions, you can remote in and and do hopefully the vast majority of what you need to do without the need to, to physically take that time um, to go there. Okay, um, so so you have you have basically a product suite for you know, not only military law enforcement. You're also expanding out to um, uh, basically corporate investigations, internal audits, things like that, and then also bringing lessons learned from each of those back to, like you said, military. Um, that's super interesting. Okay. Um, yep. And then again, your your experience in the military is going to inform a lot of that where, you know, I've been out in the field. I know what these guys are going to need. Um, uh, that's great. OK, so um, we're, we're kind of short on time. So I'm going to ask another question um, specifically related to your um, uh, work experience. What advice would you give students considering getting into information security and digital investigations? Well, I'd say round peg, round hole. 
So, you know, make sure it is what you want to be doing. Make sure um, there's not been some weird veil pulled over your eyes that you're going to be a Jack Bauer running around with something the size of a cigarette packet that can image. Uh, I don't know if they know. I don't know if students know what Jack Bauer is. So, um... oh, I'm not, <laughs> am I that out of date at all? <laughs> well, you, let's go. Let's go with James Bond. Everybody knows James Bond, right? <laughs> Um, so I'd say just make sure that, that you know what it is you're getting into and, and that you definitely have. You've got to love it. Find the passion, not the job, and the rest will come. And that's definitely what I found And within the military. And then sadly, obviously, got injured and, and lost my career there, but was blessed enough to fall into something that I've been doing for a couple of years and finding that the passion is still completely there. You know, I find it funny, eight years on in Detigo, and I'm away at some show like Techno Security, and I'm talking to a police officer about their investigations. And before you know it, 20 minutes has gone, and I'm, you know, beaming, and I'm talking about our patented technology and rapid imaging. And they're like, oh, "Wow, you still love this stuff?" And I'm like, oh, "Absolutely." The, the the moment that goes, you've got to start questioning everything. But going back to your other point, a mentor, having someone in there that can put a, you know, put an arm over you, direct you into a location. Uh, help you learn what you need to learn and just be a bit brave, reach out, you know, don't wait for it to come to you. Don't assume that you're not up for the task. Don't have that fear of failure um, or have it, but be brave, still step in. Um, you know, imposter syndrome comes up a lot, I think, for for individuals, get in there and get it cracked. But the biggest thing I notice in, in, in my particular work environment that's changed uh, over m- my tenure really is, is trying to help people with their initiative, trying to give them the tools to find the answers, or at least when they hit a roadblock, not just sit there and go, oh yeah, I've hit a roadblock. Okay, maybe don't take the next step, but think about it and come with a couple of COAS courses of action Mm -hmm. for, well, this is option one and two in my mind. What do you think? You know, and that makes such a huge difference in an organization, be it digital or just, um, you know, just commercial. Okay. Um, So just to kind of summarize, um, First off, see if you love it, which kind of implies, you know, test out some things, um, see what's online, maybe look at the look at the materials. And if you're enjoying uh, what you're studying, then keep with it. Get a mentor and then that'll help you to actually find resources that you need and then get support in the direction to go. <laughs> so we, we actually have a question from chat um, uh, and it is, uh, Andrew, do you ever get burned out from doing continuous learning and working with so many data tools devices? If so, how do you deal with it? That is an awesome question. And um, yeah, so when when we first started this in my last organization, so in the, in the special operations, we had a couple of SMEs, so subject matter experts that were put in. And you were put in and called a subject matter expert and you didn't have a clue what you were doing. You were then built up to be in that subject matter expert over over a period of time. And the first time we tried this, we did it the wrong way around. You've got, it's all a learning curve. So we went out and we got all the open source tools. We bought all the COTS tools, commercial off the shelf technology. We had access to all the government tools and we tried to learn them all. We tried to do it all. And we became what's called combat and effective, exactly as you were kind of asking there. The cognitive overload, the ability for the organization to operate was just extremely limited. So we had to tune it down and go, okay, we want now just the best of breed rather than having uh, the technology there that let's just for argument's sake, say could do 100% of everything. It's not possible for the human and for the organization to actually manage that because you'd have to know consistently how to use these 12, 15 tools. So what we wanted to do was was take the, the, the mass amount of data and problems and solve those and then have a few specialists that could do the JTAB, the chip off, the chip off, the, all the other like minutia kind of niche areas that everybody talks about and loves, but actually really in most cases uh, are, are a smaller part of your investigation overall. It's when you hit that wall on your, your biggest stream kind of pieces in regards. To, so that helped us a lot with that kind of um, uh, stress factors there. For, for me personally, um, yeah, it, it, it can be a problem, but again, it's, it's going back. We have a thing in the military where you go on an operational sort of ORM and it, it's like taking pots off the boil. So right now, if I'm super interested and I know there's a lot coming up that might be involved in one type of technology, you get yourself fully up to speed on that whilst keeping the others just on the bubble. So they're good. And all of a sudden, boom, something comes in on drones. You're like, ah, well, I haven't touched a drone in six months. 
well, great. Where's the manual? Where's the help videos? Where's those bits? Where's the SME? Can I quickly tap them up for a bit and pull that one back to the front, get that one heated up and push you? And that's a, that's a military technique? It's, it's probably across the board. Okay. It's not fair. When you're hit with so many things, it's almost by default. You can't really do it many other ways because yeah. there's only so much you can do as, as any individual. Uh, we have a couple more questions. Um, Andrew, do you have paid one-to-one coaching? I don't know what I don't know what for. Just coaching. <laughs> no, I Mentoring. Don't. Coaching is fantastic. Um, so I I I I have coaching, um, but generally the coaching is by my colleagues, uh, friends. In fact, my partner actually she works for the National Health Service as a, a learning development coach. So again, sometimes I I do this all the time i use people as a um sort of like a checkboard to go am i am i miles off here and that can even be in personal relationships with members of staff you know obviously bearing in the uh, sensitivities of things but going you know am i reading this completely wrong or am i wrong in doing this or how does this come across sometimes in those cases i'll put stuff to the side and then go back to it reread it and funnily enough you look at it and go yeah, no, that needs that needs changing. So I, was, I, I think I, I think they're asking for coaching from you, not whether you receive oh, coaching. <laughs> no, I'm afraid not. <laughs> we as a company uh, train, and I, I am occasionally one of the trainers, depending on the the, the style of opera or the style of the way our technology is going to be used. Uh, I keep all my clearances and stuff, but paid one to one. Afraid not. It's just not enough hours in the day. I'd love to. <laughs> Um, but I, I definitely feel like I'm giving much more benefit helping my whole team work and giving them what they need uh, to, to uh, sort of take that forward. But we have all sorts of training courses from your basic digital forensics all the way through to um, utilizing our, our, our patented technology and pieces like that. But, um, okay. Thanks for the shout. That's really kind. We have, uh, we have one more question. So um, can you tell us how you started your way in forensic cybersecurity world? I think we kind of covered that with military, but is there any kind of last last thing you'd like to say about um, going through the military first to begin um, in cybersecurity or digital forensics? Any final words for that? Lucky. Be, so, be lucky? Okay. <laughs> it was awesome. You know, I joined them at round, round Bowl, Round Peg. So I joined the military because that's what I wanted to do and I loved it. I joined the Marines because I loved being in the UK. It's called the Thinking Soldier. It's the longest training in the Western world. I like the reconnaissance aspect. So I went into that and then special forces. Uh, and that just opens a whole plethora of, of, of different skill sets there with different agencies. So really lucky going that way. There are a lot of groups now within the military, the Royal Military Police or the Military Police in general are utilizing a lot of this kind of technology. The specific intelligence battalions are utilizing a lot of this technology, obviously um, special operations and pieces uh, like that. So it is a great place to go in if you already love and want to do all those pieces. And once you've started that road, you can start veering off down these kind of speciality pieces, having a pension, having a great laugh, traveling the world. Obviously, occasionally it has its downsides, but that's the same with anything. Certainly in the world I've come from, it wasn't like a screamy, shouty kind of go do this, do that. Very much a, a professional, quiet operator's uh, way forward, which which was just, just amazing. So really lucky and really blessed. Ed. Okay, great. So thank you so much. Um, that's really all we have time for. Everyone... Uh, we have a quiz that Tigo kindly offered to provide some prizes. So if you fill out a little quiz about Detigo, uh, about the tools and like when you can use them in different forensic situations, then uh, they will provide these prize packs. Um, so uh, that quiz is going to be open until this Friday. So if you're looking at it now, um, uh, I will post the quiz link in the chat now. And Andrew, thank you so much for talking about us. It's super interesting hearing the military perspective and, and specifically um, how you got the skills in the military and how those are transferring over to the private sector. So really interesting. Um, it was a pleasure to talk to you. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, thanks very much, Joshua. And thanks very much for everyone out there. Yeah. Uh, reach out.